This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our unlisted YouTube channel, accessible via our Mercy site for future reference. We're happy to report that we have several of our videos um, from er earlier this year posted now. The Mercy site address is on the screen, uh, HTTP uh, MRSI dot ERDC dot DREN dot mil slash sustain. Um, if you go to this site, not only can you find the webinars, <clears throat> but also quizzes associated with our past webinars, as will be this one. If you answer the quizzes in blocks of five, you can earn CEUs uh, or learning units. Fill out the quizzes, send them to the email address at the bottom of the screen uh, with your AIA number if you have one, and we'll ensure that you uh, receive credit. Today's webinar is Life Cycle Cost Analysis, LCCA, for Energy, Construction, uh, Energy Conservation Investment Program uh, Project uh, DD1391s. For those of you who may not know, the 1391s are the documents used to submit funding requests to Congress for military construction projects. Uh, this presentation covers differences between the typical life cycle cost procedures used in design alternative selection and the life cycle cost procedures used for developing 1391 programming documents for the Energy Conservation Investment Program. The intent of the course is to assist developers of 1391s and others with the preparation of the life cycle cost assessment and to highlight the importance of USACE district involvement at the earliest stages of the ESIP project. Participants will learn the differences between design alternative life cycle cost costing and 1391 life cycle costing the major components of the 1391 LCCA, and gain an overall awareness of USACE's important role in the ESIP 1391 development. We will have time for questions at the end. Our new presenter, Mr. Graves, is a registered professional engineer with 15 years of experience in the energy and design engineering fields. He holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M uh, University and currently serves as a mechanical engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Huntsville Center providing technical support for a variety of Army energy and criteria programs. Previously in his career, he has held positions with the Mississippi State University's Industrial Assessment Center, Texas A&M's Energy Systems Laboratory, Tour Andover Controls, DOE's Clean Energy Application Center, and the U.S. Air Force. With that, I will now turn it over to Mr. Graves. All right. Good afternoon, folks, or I guess Good morning uh, for those of you guys uh, still on Pacific Coast time. Um, as indicated, we're going to be talking today about the life cycle cost analysis for the Energy Conservation Investment Program, uh, DD1391. Um, and as uh, Eric indicated, that's the form that goes to Congress uh, for request of funding. And we're going to talk about that um, in conjunction with the um, how that is different uh, than the, the typical uh, life cycle cost analysis that we do, say, for um, HVAC design alternatives uh, or things of that nature. All right, so our learning objectives, uh, we're going to discuss the life cycle cost analysis, uh, learn how the DD1391 life cycle cost analysis, tab D, uh, differ, differs from the typical design alternative life cycle cost analysis, and then finally learn how to better assist Army installations with development of those LCCAs uh, for ESIP uh, DD1391 submission. So just an outline, we're going to go through the importance of the life cycle cost analysis, uh, some typical components of a life cycle cost analysis, uh, a, show you an example of a 40-year design alternative life cycle cost analysis, and go through some of the differences, and then cover an example of the ESIP uh, LCCA, and then finally go through some tips um, for helping the Army installations submit better uh, DD1391s. So with that, the importance of the life cycle cost analysis. Um, the lowest life cycle cost option uh, provides the best long-term benefit to the government. We do life cycle cost analysis because we're not shooting for the lowest first cost. Uh, we're not necessarily shooting for the lowest operational cost, uh, but we're trying to account for all factors, uh, cost of replacement, uh, length of, uh, of life of equipment, um, you know, all factors that go into the design, we're trying to account for all of those. 
Uh, all executive order mandates regarding energy efficiency improvements carry um, the where life cycle cost effective disclaimer. So if it's not life cycle cost effective, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and finally, for the Energy Conservation Investment Program, or ESIP, um, the life cycle cost analysis is the criteria for project selection. Uh, you have to have a savings to investment ratio uh, greater than 1.25 uh, in order to be included in the ESIP program. Uh, that's, that threshold is 1.0 for renewable technologies. In other words, renewable technologies just have to pay back within their lifetime. Um, but the, the program is shooting for technologies that show a savings to investment ratio greater than 2.0. So um, those are kind of the, the criteria that we're shooting for, and the life cycle cost is an integral part of that selection process. So what are some typical components of a life cycle cost analysis? Well, the first thing are, are your first costs. This is your construction, your design, your uh, overhead and project management. Uh, there's some annually recurring costs. Those would be uh, utility costs, operational costs, maintenance costs. Um, and then a very important category are your non-recurring costs. They're, they're, um, they may recur, but they're, they're not annually recurring. Um, these would be your periodic O&M costs. Uh, total future replacement costs or, or residual value at the end of your life cycle cost analysis. Um, these would be costs or savings uh, that you would want to consider in your life cycle cost analysis. And we'll talk um, about how these in particular are important uh, within an ESIP 1391 submission. So the 40-year life cycle cost analysis example. This is the typical uh, sort of thing that we would expect you to do if you were doing a life cycle cost analysis for uh, distinguishing between different design alternatives. Um, the Army standard is a 40-year is a life cycle cost. Um, you do it for 40 years regardless of how long the stuff lasts. Um, if you have an air conditioner that's going to peter out in uh, year 20, then we consider the cost of replacement at year 20 and run it for another 20 years until we get, you know, to the 40-year uh, life cycle time. And what we would do is we would do a cost estimate. Um, annually recurring costs are calculated. Um, there's annual inspections here. There's uh, operation labor for chillers. There's operation labor for boilers, uh, maintenance, water treatment. Uh, we come up with all of our annually recurring costs. Um, we come up with our first cost items. Uh, you'll have, uh, in, in this case, there'll be mechanical uh, energy efficiency measures, different things like that, but these are the one-time costs. You get your annual costs, your one-time costs, and then we put them into a large spreadsheet. And again, this is an eye chart. I don't expect anyone to, um, to actually be able to discern these numbers, but um, what we have here is, is years going from zero to 40, and we have you know, your building improvements. These are your first costs in year zero, and then you'll see these annually recurring costs as things come due for replacement in the out years. Um, here we've got utility costs, uh, electric costs, natural gas costs, operation and maintenance costs. Those things all total up, and we get the total cost per year in terms of a cash flow, and at the end of it, we roll it up, and what we have is a net present cost for each alternative that we're considering. In this life cycle cost analysis, we were looking at um, going from a campus steam system uh, to perhaps a, um, a hydronic system, uh, basically going from steam to hot water. And there were a whole host of combined heat and power options that the customer wanted to consider. And so we looked at combined heat and power for each of those. Uh, another option was to get off of steam altogether, or well, in part, um, not get off of it altogether, but uh, to stay on steam, but to um, take portions of their distribution network and decentralize it. And so we, we did that. And then finally, the last option was to fully decentralize uh, their steam distribution system, their steam heat system. 
And what we did was a 40-year life cycle cost analysis for each design alternative. Uh, do nothing is always a consideration. Um, but what this showed was that the lowest life cycle cost option was to fully decentralize the system. Not always going to be the case. I'm not trying to make a case for uh, decentralizing uh, thermal distribution networks here. But in this case, this certainly uh, proved to be the, the lowest life cycle cost analysis. But this is the, the typical level of effort that we would expect, um, especially per the um, Unified Facilities Criteria 3-410-01. Uh, they require you to consider three design alternatives and do a 40-year life cycle cost analysis. And so this is the type of life cycle cost analysis we would typically do and see. So what are the differences between the design alternative life cycle cost analysis and an ESIP 1391 analysis? Well, the, in the design alternative selection, um, the alternatives are mutually exclusive, meaning that each one of them stands on its own. You're developing a net present cost for each one, and at the very end, you're going to consider uh, the total cost of ownership and the lowest, loss, lowest cost of ownership wins. Uh, you have two alternatives at a minimum, um, but you can have as many alternatives as you want to consider. We just looked at an example that has 17 different alternatives. Um, do nothing is sometimes an alternative, and uh, replacement in kind is usually an alternative. Uh, meaning that we just go back and, and fix the existing system, uh, renew it, um, recapitalize it, but we don't make any sort of uh, energy improvements. When we move over to justifying an ESIP DD1391, the difference is we, we don't really have mutually exclusive alternatives anymore. We, we may combine several different technologies. Uh, when you put together an ESIP project program, um, it may not be as simple as, you know, we want to decentralize the steam system. It may be decentralize the steam system, install a wind turbine, um, and give us new air conditioning. Um, but there is only one alternative represented in the DD1391. That's a key aspect um, because when you put this forward, the real question is not, is this the most life cycle cost effective alternative? The real question is, does this particular technology pay for itself within its lifetime? And for ESIP in particular, do the savings more than pay for uh, the cost of doing this retrofit in such a way that it becomes attractive to the ESIP program for selection? Um, with this, the do-nothing alternative is assumed to be invalid. In other words, we really don't, we really don't compare it against do-nothing uh, to see how much that would cost. Um, it, you know, if, if it comes back and it, it has a savings associated with it, then we assume that do-nothing is, is no longer valid. Um, the other thing that happens is replacement in kind becomes an avoided cost. And I want to talk about that in particular because most of the ESIP submissions, our office receives these ESIP submissions and we go through a validation process. And most of what uh, people spend their time on is looking at um, installed cost and energy savings. But they don't look at these non-recurring uh, savings that they can put in the cost analysis that can really improve the economics. So. An important point here is that replacement in kind becomes an avoided cost. So here's an example of a ESIP DD1391. Um, it's the same sort of thing, um, except instead of doing individual uh, tabs where we, we account for annually recurring costs, uh, first cost, uh, you know, all of these things individually, uh, we typically just have kind of a planning document. Here, here's an avoided replacement cost. Um, this is the replacement cost that we're considering. And so we're, we're looking at a delta here. It, it, for this uh, situation, it was uh, air-cooled chillers. And we were looking at uh, needing to replace uh, these certain ones. The manufacturer date uh, says that these things are 
Well, anything that has 0% life remaining is past the end of its economic useful life. These other ones were close enough that they were deemed valid for replacement. But we looked at just replacing that with a standard efficiency chiller. Um, you know, what's that? And then uh, here's the, uh, um, the replacement cost for the high efficiency chiller. Then we did our energy calculations and came up with some energy savings. Um, in this case, there weren't any uh, annually recurring savings that were taken because we considered that uh, maintaining an air-cooled chiller, we're talking about one air-cooled chiller versus another. There's nothing um, exceptional about the maintenance cost. But the point here is that this, um, this spreadsheet is used to justify everything. Uh, your annually recurring costs, uh, your maintenance costs, your first cost, your avoided costs. Um, it's a lot simpler approach. But we are talking about the planning phase. When you go into the DD1391, tab D of the 1391 is uh, the life cycle cost analysis tab. And this um, screen capture here is basically the format of that DD1391. And we'll, it, just so you're not worried about reading this, there are slides that will break this down a little bit later. In fact, let's just dig right into that. Um, there's, there's three major areas. There's the investment costs, there's the energy savings costs, and then there's the non-energy savings costs. And so with the investment costs, these are the typical um, investment costs that we see. We've got a construction cost, and this needs to be based on the major pieces of equipment and all of the ancillary things necessary to provide a complete and usable system. The Corps of Engineers will come in and put the design fee, 5.7% uh, SIOH, and then 4% uh, for design, build, construction, and I think that goes up to like 6% if it's going to be an in-house design. Um, but we pull all that together to get a total cost. Typically, we do not consider salvage value of existing equipment. Most of what we're replacing is at the end of its useful life, and, and it's really hard to get the contractor to give you money back on that sort of thing. Um, and then public utility company rebates, in a lot of situations, we can't receive those. Um, so that there's some, some things that we have to talk about there. The key here is this total investment. This is the ultimate number that goes to Congress for consideration. And the only sin greater than not getting money is not getting enough money. So we want to be careful uh, with these salvage values and these public utility company rebates because they reduce this total investment number uh, that we're requesting. So just a caveat there, there are some situations where those may come into play, but in general we don't, we don't see that a whole lot. And there's another way to take care of that that I think is a little bit more robust and it keeps your, uh, your capital request at the level that, that we need it to be. The second area is the energy savings and or costs. Um, in this case, we were replacing electric chillers. We came up with an MMBTU uh, per year savings. There was a utility rate. Uh, looks like that was somewhere around six cents a kilowatt hour, I think. Uh, and uh, we come up with an annual savings dollar. These discount factors, uh, when you import this data into the PACS system, which is the DD1391 processor system, that the Army uses for submission, the discount factors will automatically be considered uh, based upon the latest factors from NIST, and these will come up with a discounted savings. Um, this is basically the energy savings tab, and when we do the MMV on tab F, this is the value that they will be looking to measure and verify. So it's very important that, the, that this value here is reflective um, of the savings of the project over and against uh, what they are currently using, uh, unless the MMV plan indicates something differently. Finally, the section, the third section, is the non-energy savings or costs. And in this case, we would look at things, uh, annually recurring costs, things like uh, maintenance contracts. Uh, for instance, if you were going to replace a water-cooled chiller with an air-cooled chiller. If they have a chemical contract for a cooling tower water treatment, that would be an annually recurring savings that the installation would receive. You would want to 
put that value in here. Non-recurring savings, this is where we would put our avoided replacement cost. Uh, what we said here was that it was going to cost us one point one and a quarter million dollars to replace um, the existing air-cooled chillers with an in-kind replacement. And what I mean by that is if you had standard efficiency air-cooled chillers, you get to replace those with standard efficiency air-cooled chillers. Um, it's, it's very important that we don't start comparing, you know, chillers are kind of a bad example. Well, maybe not. It, you don't want to say we're going to do a water-cooled chiller replacement and they've got air-cooled chillers currently, but the current replacement would, would not be the, the what they have now. It would be the state-of-the-art high-efficiency air-cooled machines. Um, the way that our cost guys explain it is um, if you have a Chevrolet and you're going to go buy a Cadillac, you don't get to say that by buying the Cadillac you avoided purchasing a Lincoln. And so the, it's very key that when you do this avoided uh, replacement cost, that it is avoided replacement in kind. But the avoided replacement cost is extremely important because if we don't consider it, it drops the savings to investment ratio, which I don't see that on here. That should be at the bottom. But um, that drops the savings to investment ratio from 1.26, which meets the ESIP threshold, down to 0.45, which means that the project would never go forward in a million years. So we need to consider this avoided replacement cost for things that are due for replacement. We desperately need to consider that um, in the ESIP 1391s in order to get an accurate representation of the costs. So here's some tips for helping Army installations submit better 1391s. The, the key thing is get involved early on. Um, plan an annual site visit uh, for 1391 development. Most of these uh, installations have resource efficiency managers, and they are tasked with coming up with, um, with 1391s for the ESIP program. We'll have a data call, and they will be putting these things together. These resource efficiency managers, some of them are very good, uh, but many of them, their expertise is in energy savings. So they're very good at coming up with ideas. They're very good at, at projecting energy costs. But where they fall short is in estimating the actual cost of business um, for installing something for the government. This is an area that the districts are uniquely qualified because you guys design projects and implement projects all the time for these installations. You can um, serve a very, very important role in assisting these, uh, these sites with developing the appropriate costs. And again, I'll go back to the only sin greater than not getting money is not getting enough money. Uh, one of the key problems that we've had is that we will see a submission package come through with a great SIR. Um, you know, we'll look at the energy savings. They'll have all their backup information for that, and then we'll get to the implementation cost, and it'll be like, well, we just thought we could, you know, buy this, um, you know, for this amount of money. Well, where did you get your cost? Well, we didn't consider a lot of things. We didn't know that that chiller wouldn't fit through that door. Um, you know, there's things about construction that were not considered at all. And when you start to uh, look at those sorts of things and take a hard look and a hard scrub at it, um, we get in a situation where the costs begin to go up, the investment goes up, and of course the savings to investment ratio goes down. And you know we have a problem that could have been mitigated by early involvement by the design team that would be implementing the project. So assist um, with the development of that cost estimate. Um, provide the details of the cost estimate as an attachment. Um, a lot of times we'll get the details of the energy savings as an attachment to the 1391, but as much as you can provide details of the cost estimate as an attachment, that really helps our cost engineers to take a look at these 1391s when they come in and say, yeah, the, these things have been accounted for. It looks like all the parts and pieces are there. This is a good estimate. Let's move forward. Um, a lot of times what we'll see is there will be one value put in tab A, um, 
for the project, and there will be a lump sum, and there will be no details um, of that cost estimate. Um, big key here, always, always, always consider the avoided replacement costs for items that are at the end of their useful life and must be uh, replaced anyway. And uh, also remember that cost and energy differences are captured on the DD1391 tab D. What you're looking at on tab D is the difference in energy and the cost of energy between what they're doing now and what they propose to do. And so that that goes for you know what they will have to do in terms of replacing equipment. In other words, um, do nothing is, is not an alternative. Remember that in the 1391 process, we assume do nothing is not an alternative. Uh, if time and funds allow, help the installation perform a design alternative LCCA to determine the best alternative before developing the 1391. A common refrain that I hear from the districts, because the way this, this process works is the REMS at the district or at the installation will put together this package the district will have no involvement at all. Um, this package will go up. They will get money. We will have money approved by Congress. Um, it comes through our office for validation. We say, hey, you need to look at these parts and pieces. Uh, the, the installation will pull together as much of that as they can. But a lot of times, these projects are already selected. And then it will go to the district, and the district will say, you know, hey, this is great. We've got enough money. This looks like this project's going to work, but you know, somebody really should have looked at this because this is a much better idea. Um, you know, th this isn't the best idea. Um, and so there's a role to play there. Uh, if you can help the installation perform that design alternative LCCA to select the optimum alternative before ever submitting the funding document, that will ensure that we get the best life cycle cost alternative. As far as when we talk about time and funds allowing, I have been told, and I don't know if this has changed, uh, Tom Delaney has been replaced by Sarah Mendez. Um, but Tom's uh, direction to us at Huntsville Center uh, and, and our program managers who are managing the ESIP program is that he has funds available to help the districts um, or to pay the districts to help the installations with the development of ESIP DD 1391 packages. So when we say if time and funds allow, the, it begs the question, where's the money going to come from? Well, that can come from Axim. So um, they say that they have money available. So we need to be able to uh, tap into those funds to assist our installations with putting together good projects. Tips for uh, other tips. Uh, use ASHRAE support data for economic life of of equipment not in the ESIP guidance. One other key difference between ESIP and the typical LCCA, the typical LCCA is, is a 40-year life cycle. The ESIP life, uh, there is an economic life that we put in there that is based upon the equipment that you're selecting. If you're doing a controls replacement, controls last 10 years. If you're doing a lighting replacement, lighting systems last 10 years. If you're doing a, um, an air conditioning replacement, they suggest using 20 years. Uh, ASHRAE actually says 19 on, on air-cooled uh, air conditioning equipment. I, I tend to think it's more closer to 15, but you know these are the kinds of things that we can debate. At the end of the day, um, one of the, the key difference between the ESIP and the typical LCCA is that ESIP uh, equipment life and the life of the LCCA is dependent upon the technology that you're se selecting. There is no real standard link there, uh, but there is some guidance uh, that ESIP publishes annually that will give you that. Uh, for things that are not in there, use this ASHRAE data. Um, this website here has a public database of um, HVAC uh, type equipment, boilers, chillers. The big one is water source heat pumps. You know, there's a big um, debate as to when we install uh, ground source wells, how long do those last? Some people say they last 100 years. The ASHRAE data suggests that it lasts 25 to 30 years. Um, you know, 40 years is kind of another number that gets thrown out, 50 years. Um, 
use this as the support for your assertion of the equipment life that you're choosing. Um, there's a lot of good information in there that will help you build the case. Finally, uh, life cycle cost analysis. It's an important decision-making tool for both project programming and design. We do them a little bit differently for project programming uh, than we do for design. Um, but it, it's a very important decision-making tool for both of those. Uh, the LCCA approach is used for ESIP 1391 tab D, and the analysis of design alternatives are related but different. Uh, they all have the same types of components, but we assemble them a little bit differently and look for different uh, parts and pieces. And finally, but I think most importantly, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has an important role with, East, with Army installations before the ESIP funds are programmed. Um, we, we are getting the cart before the horse if the people designing these systems are not being involved at the very outset of, of this project programming um, effort. So we want to get you guys involved as early as possible. And if you understand uh, what people are looking for in the life cycle cost analysis, the tab D, that will help you better assess the design and uh, program the project. So with that, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, folks, as, uh, as usual. Um, there have already been some uh, activity on the right-hand side of the screen. You will see a column there with a, uh, on the right-hand side with a, <laughs> excuse me, text box at the bottom. <clears throat> Enter your uh, question in that text box and I'll scroll down through them and, and read them aloud. Uh, I'll try to consolidate some uh, repetitious questions and maybe uh, keep things grouped together. So don't be too alarmed if I skip your question. We might come back to it. Um, so basically, uh, I think the first one was about the spreadsheet. I'm trying to scroll back to it. It keeps jumping around on me. Um, the availability of the spreadsheet. Does your spreadsheet list and calculate the percentage differences of other alternatives above the lowest life cycle cost? I'm not sure which um, spreadsheet we're talking about there, if that was the 40-year life cycle cost spreadsheet that I showed first, or if that's the ESIP DD-13. I, I think that was the first one. Um, It, it does not calculate uh, differences of other alternatives above the lowest life cycle cost um, currently, uh, but it can be made to do that very, very easily. Um, the avail and I see the second part of that, the availability of the spreadsheet uh, versus using BLCC. Um, the BLCC software, in my experience, uh, has been sort of difficult to use, um, and I know that we are supposed to use that. That's technically the, the one that um, we are supposed to use. The problem with BLCC is that the BLCC is based upon um, the cost factors in effect at the time that you download the program. And each year when NIST updates the cost factors, you have to go through the process of calling ACIT, getting BLCC updated with the latest version of the cost factors. The other problem that you run into is that NIST will publish the cost factors. They used to publish them every October, uh, but through 2014, uh, 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, they started getting in this uh, deal where they were several months late. Um, but the, the point is when, when NIST uh, issues the cost factors, it takes BLCC a few months to update the cost factors and issue a new executable file for you to download to use the most recent cost factors. 
what what's the end result of that? Well, VLCC, a lot of times you'll do a project in VLCC, it'll look great, and then you go and you put it in packs, and it looks not so great anymore. And the reason for that is that PAX uh, updates the cost factors almost immediately uh, when they um, when NIST issues the new cost factors. And the spreadsheet that I use, I uh, I actually took it from the National Guard. They were the guys that put it together, and I've modified it. But um, there's a, a, a work page. Uh, worksheet in there that has the uh, the NIST cost factors in it where I can download those as soon as NIST publishes them. And what I found is that it emulates the PAX processor, which is the official programming uh, SIR number that will be used, regardless of what VLCC says. The PAX system is what gets reported to Congress. Um, and, and my spreadsheet, I think, uh, reflects that number a lot better. Uh, you may ask, why would you not just go into PAX and, and adjust it there if that's the official one? Uh, the reason for that is that PAX uh, logs every change that you make uh, to a lifecycle cost, and uh, you don't really want to be logged into PAX changing numbers around and different things like that. Uh, you really kind of want to wait on PAX until you got your package together and are ready to put it in and submit it. And so that spreadsheet allows you to kind of uh, see where things are. My my savings to investment ratios on that um, spreadsheet, that um, ESIP spreadsheet, will be off by about a hundredth of a point on a SIR calculation, but it's it's definitely close enough to get you in that uh, uh, you know 1.25. I mean we're we're really looking for things that are you know in the tenths of points. Um, the hundredths of points don't matter as much. Okay, I think uh, there were um, several questions about the the BCC five uh, BLCC five versus the spreadsheet. Uh, I think you kind of covered most of it. Uh, somebody, if you think that we didn't cover that adequately enough for you, uh, just feel free to type in your question again because uh, I think I'm going to jump over the rest of those that were kind of going back and forth on the uh, spreadsheet versus BLCC five. Um, and I think you covered the PACS data. Um, there's a question about where you get your your data, RS means. Um, does, does RS means play a factor into this? Or? Uh, yes. Uh, RS means is uh, the cost tool that our cost engineers uh, often uh, compare against. But um, most, most cost engineering branches within the core uh, have the ability to look at a, a variety of, of sources. There's parametric cost estimating where we take a look at, at other costs um, that Army um, installations have received as part of quotes and bids. Um, and sometimes that uh, reveals a little bit different cost uh, for the same type of project. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert on that. I've, I've got some cost engineers who really dig into that. I personally use RS means. Um, for most of my costing, um, I will use GSA Advantage. Uh, I will use the website if there's particular pieces of equipment, uh, heat pump water heaters or um, you know lamp replacements that you're going to do in-house with in-house labor. Um, if you've got a, a, a DPW staff that's capable of going around and doing wholesale light bulb changes, it may be more cost effective for them to go purchase the things off of GSA Advantage. Um, and that is a much better cost estimate uh, than even RS means because means is going to be high. Uh, GSA is also typically fairly high, but the difference is with GSA, you, the installation can go purchase it directly from GSA. It's a pre-competed price. You know that the government can purchase it for that dollar value. Those make for very strong cost estimates. So I, I do use RS means predominantly, but I, I do use other sources where appropriate. Okay, uh, and somebody has an, another question. Uh, getting onto the uh, the HVAC equipment, if there's a piece of HVAC equipment that is at the end of its useful life, can we include the replacement cost as a cost avoidance or cost savings to an alternative? Yes, that is that is one of the key points that I have tried to make through the presentation. The avoided cost of replacement is absolutely to be considered. Uh, the key is it needs to be the avoided cost of replacement in kind. 
You can't say that um, you know all these chillers are old and need to be you know need to be replaced. Um, you know we would replace them with high efficiency chillers, except there's super high efficiency chillers that we want as part of this ESIP project. You can't do that. That's a that's a bait and switch. You have to use a standard efficiency chiller and use that as your basis for avoided cost of replacement in kind. Um, as long as you're not trying to inflate the avoided cost of replacement so as to um, unfairly game the LCCA, you know, considering the avoided cost of replacement in kind is totally appropriate. You, you absolutely should do that. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to one that's uh, along a similar vein. A uh, ground source heat pump, uh, we now use a 40-year uh, life cycle uh, for FY17 ESIP. Uh, and but PAX only goes up to 30 years. Um, is there something being done to reconcile that? Well, that's one of the areas I, I didn't really get into it a whole lot. But um, if you have a situation where the life in the LCCA, and, and again, I'm glad they pointed this out, the, the maximum life that can be considered uh, in the DD1391 processor is 30 years. Um, if you have equipment life that goes beyond that, what you would do is show the remaining life of that equipment as a residual value in year 30. And so if, if I may go back, um, I'll back up here to answer that. Right here where you have a, a savings uh, for avoided replacement, what you would do is you would have a residual value, and I, I typically put it in this last row um, because I like to order these by year of occurrence. But if you had a a 40-year life cycle system like a ground source heat pump, um, I would put a residual value here, and then you would have a savings that would be the straight line depreciated amount. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, no, that would be the present value uh, because we're about to depreciate it here. You would put the present value of that system, whatever's still going to be here, um, in year 30, and you would have a year of occurrence in year 30. And there's some debate whether you, you'd use the, the present value or, or if you do some sort of depreciation because in year 30 it is going to be kind of old and dilapidated. But um, with this discount factor in year 30, it's going to be so small anyway that the discounted savings is almost going to be negligible. But the way that you handle um, things that will have a residual value um, at the end of the project life is by putting it in as a non-recurring savings because that's something that still has value even though the, the project life has ended. Okay, and there was a question. Is there a place that uh, our participants can uh, download or uh, otherwise obtain uh, both the spreadsheet that you used instead of the BC BLCC5 as in the National Guard spreadsheet that you mentioned? Um, I don't have a place uh, that we can download it, but I, I can surely get it out to you. Okay, maybe if you go to the last slide with your email address on it, uh -huh. uh, people can send you an email. Would that be all right? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, somebody you, just, just, just so that... Pardon me? I was going to say, just so that um, I, I don't get um, 30 or 40 emails um, with various things, if y'all could just say uh, LCCA spreadsheet in the subject line, that way I can group everything together. Okay. Do, do you have access to a LCCA Mercy site? Um, I'm not familiar with the Mercy site, but... Um, okay. Um, Kelly, if you can send, uh, send them a link... Or actually, if you could send the if you can send the uh, the files to Kelly Kelly Polzin P O L Z I N she's in the global, uh, okay. and then she will post it on the LCCA Mercy site. Excellent. That I, I'll be happy to send it to you, Kelly. Okay. And somebody also asked, what is the process of requesting funds uh, from Axem uh, Tom Delaney for assistance for energy managers at posts? Well, I don't know that I can comment. A whole lot on the process um, because I, our program manager would be the one to, to really uh, get into the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, what I know is that they have a data call uh, in March every year. In fact, we're, we're looking at it now 
um, where they uh, request projects uh, for right now we're doing the FY17 uh, submission. We've gotten in the projects and uh, the installations have submitted those. We've got them. We're racking and stacking them. And ESIP right now is a $150 million program that is split three ways uh, between the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy. Um, it's competitive. We compete with the, with the Army and the Navy, um, I mean the Air Force and the Navy. Um, but what I can tell you is last year, uh, each one of us got about $45 million a piece, and the other $15 million, uh, I think, went to other entities that could receive the same pot of money. So even though it's a $150 million program, and if Army submitted you know, a whole bunch of projects that had an SIR of three, we could conceivably get all of it. Uh, it would take that sort of effort for us to grab that whole pot of money, and even then I'm not sure that they wouldn't still divvy it up. Um, but typically the Army share has been uh, around $50 million. And so what we shoot for here when we assemble the package to go up to Axum for review is we take everyone's package submission, we go through our validation process. That process is outlined in the ESIP 1391 guidance, which is published annually, I think the 2016 guidance, if you just Google it, um, you can find it. Um, or if you contact Dominic Rigucci, um, you can find him in the, in the global. Um, he'll be happy to send you a, a copy of the, of the latest ESIP guidance. But there's a process in there for validation. And we go through that process. And through that process, we begin to rack and stack things according to SIR, according to technology. There's certain goals that Axum has. Um, for instance, if you have a water savings project, put it in. It doesn't matter if it's marginal. If it's water savings, uh, they, they want to do water savings. Uh, biomass is another uh, buzzword that Axum is looking for. There have been several biomass projects that have been selected because they met certain uh, department energy goals. So while it is primarily based on the savings to investment ratio and the LCCA is a key part of all of this, there are other factors to consider. So um, all of that stuff gets racked and stacked. We submit it to Axum, and Axum comes back and says, uh, these are the projects that we've selected. We typically try to put together a, a, a rack and stack spreadsheet that has about $100 million worth of projects on it. That way, there is some variability in, in what they can select. Um, but historically, the things that have been water savings projects have fared very well. The things that have been uh, biomass projects or renewable projects um, in general have fared very well, but biomass in particular. Um, and you know, from my perspective, once it goes through the validation and the Huntsville team here has a um, a good feeling about all the information that's put into it, um, you know, we can submit that up and then Axum will make those selections. As far as the nuances of how those selections are made, uh, I can't get, I don't know the details of, of how all that happens. Right. I mean, I, I was just up on the Hill talking to a, a congressman about some wood products, and uh, the timber industry in this country has um, has been going through some uh, some some pains uh, with as far as the uh, outsourcing of a lot of the milling goes and a lot of uh, there, there are other political reasons and things of looking at uh, some types of projects and bi biomass may or may not be in that category uh, so sometimes they might they might pursue something that maybe doesn't have as high a SIR um, I mean a, as good a SIR as it should um, for for other reasons and there are some things like uh, you know permeable pavement uh, you know that are great for the Restoring the water to the ground table, uh, groundwater, and all that, but there's no there's no return on investment. Um, there's there's nothing in it monetarily. It's just kind of like the quote unquote right thing to do from a sustainability perspective, and those can factor into things. Um, but somebody does ask, what typically happens if an ESIP approved by Congress doesn't meet the calculated SIR, uh, or is later proven that the submitted SIR is not realistic? Well, we get into a do loop there um, that becomes very difficult to get out of. Um, that's why we want to have district involvement on the front end so that the projects that go forth don't run into problems. 
the earlier on you're involved, the fewer problems we experience. Um, so I just want to stress that again. Um, what typically happens is um, the project will come back to Huntsville Center and to the district, and they will say, okay, uh, we've got a project for $7 million for a, um, a I don't know, a, a solar PV array uh, at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Well, we can't do a solar PV array at Fort Polk because we found out that the land use, it's, it's a landfill. We can't build anything on a landfill. Um, and there's no electrical grid connection. And the, the rim didn't consider how, how much it would take to get to the grid and all that sort of stuff. We can't do solar PV. The next question is, what can we do for $7 million that will have a payback that meets the ESIP criteria? In other words, we, we don't want to give the money back. What can we do? Well, maybe we can do uh, chiller replacements, and that'll work. Maybe we can do, you know, other kinds of things. Uh, the district gets involved in doing that work sometimes. Huntsville Center gets involved in doing that work sometimes. Um, a lot of times what happens is uh, we will come back with a project um, that, that will cash flow. Uh, hopefully, we're able to come back with a project that's not too far off the original programmed amount. Um, that way we can actually spend the money. But there are a, a lot of times what will happen is uh, they'll put together a project like that. And uh, if it's, you know, if a $7 million solar PV project turns into a $5 million uh, chiller replacement project, then there's $2 million in bid savings that gets reinvested in the, in the next round of, of projects that were on the list. Um, in certain cases, there are things that, um, you know, we, we send it back up and Axum goes to Congress and they acknowledge, okay, the savings to investment ratio isn't what we thought it was. Is it a still is it still a good idea? Um, and if we say yes, then they say do it. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, as pointed out by somebody else on the side, I, I forgot to mention that uh, below the slide uh, in the center area, on the left-hand corner, there's a, a download arrow that looks like a down arrow going into the old style uh, inbox. Uh, you can click on that and you can download the slides, uh, especially the slides that were kind of hard to read on this little screen. Uh, it should download in a higher res in the original resolution, which was a higher resolution. Uh, so I'd encourage everybody to uh, to download those if, uh, if they want more on this. Um, are the ESIP annual data calls uh, broadcast to the districts or or how would somebody know if they want to find out when uh, HNC is looking for projects? Um, I don't know if our uh, program managers and project managers are broadcasting that. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't. Um, what I do know is that the installations should know, and we've asked the installations to work with uh, their area engineers and resident engineers, if they have them, uh, to get assistance from the core. That's usually met from the core side by saying, we don't have money to do this effort. And that, I am told, is not true. We do have money for that to happen. We just need to initiate the discussion. Um, if the, if the districts would like to be copied on that, I can I will certainly make a note of that and talk to our program managers about issuing uh, that information out to the districts. Um, and, and that way the districts can know when that's going to happen. Okay, I think we just have uh, quite, uh, enough time for maybe one or more one or two more questions. There was I think a, what's more of a comment on uh, differing fuel rates uh, in the tab D. Uh, which I think just might be a, a bug report, um, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, but otherwise, um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I mentioned uh, the, the downloading availability of the, uh, of the slides there. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, window up for a while, leave the meeting uh, running for a while, so that people have an opportunity to download uh, that presentation. It may, may take a while, uh, depending on the bandwidth and everything that you're on. Uh, so I'll leave this up for a few more minutes. But I want to thank everybody coming, and uh, and also thank you, uh, Rhett Graves, and um, thank you also, uh, Kelly Paulson, for for uh, volunteering to take on that uh, posting of the files on the Mercy site. Uh, she had the uh, website up there. Uh, you can scroll back up uh, if you missed it. 
uh, and I will now talk, stop the uh, recording, and uh, everyone have a nice day.